good. So now is the time for some questions. I'm hoping that there'll be questions from the Zoom room as well. Otherwise it means you haven't heard anything and, uh, <laughs> and you're very patient people because you're still there. Um, and I'm also hoping there'll be questions from the floor and I think we have our first one. So. So, um, during your talk about meta. Yes. And about being with other people and you talked about somebody that uh, you had difficulty with and when you were on a retreat, that person kept coming to mind. And it so reminded me of me. Yeah. And uh, somebody that I am similarly struggling with. So could you just go over again about how to deal with a inverted commas difficult person <laughs> Uh, whilst really holding meta and loving kindness towards them and towards myself? The main point for me was that it came naturally, so I didn't try to force anything because it was a very delicate situation. And had I gone to the person before I'd fully nourished myself, I think it would have been detrimental for me. So I really waited until I was in a good situation where I was practicing a lot of meta for myself and the person simply popped up. I didn't invite them to come in. I didn't even, you know, intentionally think about the person. It was just intuitive. So I feel that it happened because I'd done the healing in myself to the extent that I would be able to, um, I, my mind would be wide enough and soft enough to be able to kind of shock absorb any impact. So to me, it showed me that Metta is very intuitive and has its own innate wisdom and that we can't rush the process. Like we can have the intention to forgive or the intention to have Metta, but even just leaving that aside and carrying on with our own practice and our own kindness towards ourselves will in time bring those conditions about. So it may never have happened, but it just did happen that time without me actually doing anything about it. And I think that's why it was actually effective. It wasn't like I was trying to create a feeling I should have towards that person. I was actually nurturing the hurt. Nurturing the hurt. And when you say that person popped up, you mean came into your mind rather than... Yeah, just... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no. <laughs> Luckily, that person was far away. And uh, my teacher has a lovely phrase. He says, love the tiger from a distance. So it's not that forgiveness means you have to invite the person back into your life. Or that if you have meta, you know, you should be close to that person physically. Sometimes you might never want to be or, you know, it might be very wise to keep that distance. But the person just came up in my mind for some reason, just a, a thought or a reflection. I think it was more like just an image of that person. And I just noticed that it didn't trigger anything. It was very interesting. It was as if uh, my own good karma at that moment, if you like, was so strong that it offset any negative uh, impact there. Yeah. So I would say just go slowly, be patient, don't try to rush anything because your own healing process is what matters most. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Can people still hear? Everyone still here? Yay. Okay. Excellent. So now I don't see the chat box. Um, this has died. Oh, it's died. It didn't like all this. Ah, so here's the chat box. Great. Okay. <laughs> so I can read the chat box from afar. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. Any questions from the floor? They don't have to be questions. They can also be comments or observations, reflections. Yes. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts about how you actually protect yourself if you are in that kind of relationship, whatever kind it is, that, you know, um, yeah. with that, how do you protect yourself against being in that, being the, the emotional punch bag that someone say like a narcissist yep. would, um, the way they'd be treating you. Yep. And, Acknowledge that um, it's not serving a lady wrong. Right. Being Absolutely. Absolutely. Position. Absolutely. So I just kind of, you know, I, I end up following advice and going completely no contact. Mm. Um, 
and when, when I had to deal with this person, I simply went grey rock. Grey rock. Kind of yeah. But that, in a sense, kills mm -hmm. because it goes against my nature. Yeah. But again, I had to protect yep. myself because yep. again, perfect wasn't serving me. So I just kind of was interested in in your kind of thoughts, your experiences. And, yeah. You know, how, how you might share okay. That with Thank you so much. Thank you for that really heartfelt and quite vulnerable question. Because I mean, I, I kind of was getting all kind of really kind of self harming, yeah. suicidal yep. feelings. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, that's common. Yep. When, when you're in relationships, mm -hmm. narcissists, yeah. Work relationships or family relationships or or intimate relationships. Right, right. Wonderful question and um, maybe pertinent to many other people too. I think you asked the right person because <laughs> I have experience like this too and quite a recent experience and that was exactly what it was. It was uh, the question for everyone on the Zoom is that how do you actually protect yourself from say narcissistic abuse um, when it's having a really major impact on your mental health, you know, driving you to maybe suicidal thoughts or other things like because it goes against our nature sometimes to want to make a complete boundary or a complete break with that person and yet we know the relationship serves nobody basically and I think in those cases yeah it is often the only solution is to have a complete break if at all possible and sometimes if you are in an abusive situation it's uh, the leaving that's the hardest part and I think at that time you really need to draw on friends you really need to know who are your true friends and try to get their support, um, try to tell them what's happening, hopefully without pathologizing the behavior too much, because that I've noticed can put people off. Um, sometimes we're the only one with the experience of how that person behaves behind closed doors. Um, and other people see the charm and the, you know, <laughs> all the other sides of that person, which is an aspect of narcissism that they come across as very charming, very helpful. Um, but it, there can be a very different dynamic behind closed doors. Um, so I think as soon as you can start talking about it to other people that you really trust, talking about it in terms of the effects it's having on you, the way it makes you doubt yourself, the way you're being gaslighted, you know, all that kind of stuff. Because getting that validation from someone who knows you is really key to kind of believing in your own experience because it's very confusing when it happens. It's extremely confusing. And if you are a person who tends to take the blame or tends to always inquire, am I doing something wrong? It can be even harder to make the break because you're always trying to give the benefit of the doubt. So there are certain times that it's not helpful to do that. And the only thing is to actually withdraw from the situation completely. And unfortunately, in that kind of situation, often other people will go with that other person. They won't see through it and they'll take other people away as well. And for me, I just have to recognize that they were never really true friends. Um, the most important thing is we preserve our own mental health and our own um, balance of mind. You know, it's absolutely not OK to be in any kind of manipulative, abusive, gaslighting kind of relationship. Um, and you feel so different when you're around good people who really care. It's just, you know, like I mentioned about uh, the retreat in, in Perth around uh, the Singaporean group who come every year <clears throat> and who've known me for years. It was just so different in their company. You know, they saw the best in me. They um, kind of validated my experience and, you know, they were just there to help me heal. So, yeah, I don't know if that really answers it, but... Yeah, just going, um, no contact. Yeah. Actually, I've got my life back. Good, so good, I'm good. Six months behind Great. You. Great. Feeling myself again. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but there's still sometimes that the odd time that yeah. I'm being concerned about this other person. You know, yeah. They're, they're sure. Suffering. Sure, they're and suffering. You can't help that person by no. as I say, using yourself as an emotion or allowing yourself to become that emotional Correct. Correct, because it doesn't serve the other person. This gentleman was just saying that you can't allow yourself to be the emotional punch bag. Even if you do feel compassion for the person, the person needs counselling. And unfortunately, if it is a narcissistic personality disorder or whatever, it's very hard. It's very unlikely they're going to seek that counselling um, because it's not part of the 
spectrum <laughs> of that behavior pattern. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, we have to do the love of the tiger from a distance, but yeah, I mean, from time to time they'll pop up, but I don't think you need to invite them to either. I mean, what's most important now is you regain that sense of your own goodness. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. And sometimes there's nothing we can do. So the Buddha did say in that kind of situation, we have to have equanimity. I was reading a sutta in here just earlier, and it said that some people will use harsh words, they will get upset for the slightest thing. Um, you know, when you say something to them, they'll react with criticism and with hatred. And the only thing to do is to have equanimity toward the person, which means distance. And sometimes people don't realize that the Buddha was very bounded, actually. He was very clear on those things. Um, so yeah, although we can talk about boundless metta, which spreads to all beings, I think there's always a, a place for bound, boundaried metta as well, that protects ourselves first of all. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, and I'm sorry you had to go through that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anything else? Oh, all right, okay. Uh, I'm having a lot of anxiety recently. This is from the Zoom. There's a huge decision to make in a couple of months, and I can't help but run toward the future. The anxiety manifests in situations completely unrelated to the future, but it's really intense being anxious about things I haven't been before, e.g. flying. Do you have any suggestions for a quick fix to calm down when it gets too <laughs> intense? <laughs> a longer term method for situations like this. Thank you for your card. Excellent. That was quick. Um, yeah, I think it's a wise question in that you understand there's a need for a longer term method. And that is definitely the practice of loving kindness. At least that's one of them. But real loving kindness doesn't seek to actually cure, it only seeks to care. So it's about integrating the anxiety into your life as though it were a friend in need of your care, rather than trying to push it out of your body and mind, because that will just add aversion to the anxiety. So it becomes being afraid of the anxiety, being averse to the anxiety you know, being anxious about being anxious and the whole thing just multiplies. Um, it is very different when it happens and when it's intense. But um, one of the ways that I've worked with intense anxiety is to do the letting be meditation. So you don't actually do it, right? You just let be. <laughs> um, and one method I find quite helpful or one way of using the mind is to sit notice there's anxiety and to really try to get in touch with the feelings at that time even though it goes completely against the grain because the nature of that anxiety is it almost like repels you away you can't get close to it it's just too difficult and sometimes when i was sitting during my mains retreat i had this feeling like it, the whole body sort of swirling around and not even feeling embodied at all and i just had to you know although that was very scary and it almost felt like things closing in I just really made the decision to go into it into it into it and go through the body with the body scan until I actually contacted it and once I contacted some of the sensations underneath it it seemed so much less overpowering than it had before it's often when we're avoiding something or when we're escaping from something that it becomes so big you know it's like we're making a monster out of a mouse but when we actually turn to face it, it is just a little mouse. So I did that and then I was able to contact the sensations. And then if it would become again quite intense, I would like spread out my awareness. So like, don't go to the really difficult part, but from time to time, just step back, stand back from the whole situation, if you like, mentally. So you can actually expand the sphere of your awareness, even to take in some of the room around you, some of the atmosphere around you and give it space. Yeah. Um, sometimes, yeah, just a quick fix, I guess, as in <laughs> something to just help you stay present and to calm you down is to use phrases of loving kindness. You know, maybe put your hand on your heart or if there's someone there, try and get some physical contact, like have a hug or hold someone's hand. If you haven't got anyone's hand to hold, hold your own hand or hold a teddy bear or something. I've got a teddy bear here and finally people are starting to pick it up. Normally it takes about three, four days, so <laughs> they only have three days. So they, 
they have to start picking it up now yeah <laughs> and um it helps you know because it brings you back to your senses literal senses you're not out of your mind but you need to be like tangibly in connection with your body so um you can do that you can put your hands on your chest or wherever you want you can actually give yourself a hug and then you can say you know may i mm, be kind to this anxiety or may i hold this anxiety with care or may i be gentle to myself or whatever it is or you can even say things like it's okay sweetheart i'm here for you you know i'm here for you you're safe things like that i mean it sounds kind of strange but it's the reassurance that you need. It's the kind of reassurance a mother would give to a child, isn't it? So we can learn to speak to ourselves like that and that can really help. So I hope that's okay. I mean, it may be that, uh, you know, when we're kind of deepening our practice on the path, uh, we uncover deeper layers of these things, of the anxieties. Because when Mara is not really challenged that much, Mara is like the personification of our um, afflictive emotions, let's say. Uh, when it's not really challenged, then he doesn't rear his head. But when he's challenged, say if you have an aspiration to go deeper in your practice, or especially if you want to ordain, then hmm, it's like saying, okay, Mara, let's see what you've got. And you'll get challenged internally because, you know, we're doing a big job here. We're trying to overcome things like greed, hate, and delusion, which are ingrained in our minds. So it's actually not necessarily a bad sign at all it can be a sign of growth in the path. Someone says, bowing to the person who bravely asked the question about narcissistic abuse, thank you. So it's really helpful to others as well. Is there anything else there? Uh, yeah, thank you again for talking about this topic. If a person is unable to put distance between them and the narcissistic person, what advice should we heed? I think you have to surround yourself by a lot of friends and try to spend time with other people as well. Maybe read some books about it, uh, get some counselling if you can, because you need to keep a perspective on what is, you know, appropriate way to treat you and what is not. And sometimes when you speak to somebody who's an expert in this, they just immediately say that's clearly narcissistic behaviour or psychopathic behaviour. And, you know, in my case, this person told me it was a very severe case. And that was so validating for me because I knew something was wrong. And I didn't know quite how severe it was because the person was quite fine on the outside to most people, you know, functioning in life. Um, so I think it can be really, really helpful to talk to an expert about these things. I mean, basically boundaries is the, is the thing. Um, and maybe just, I mean, I'm not the best at this. It's something I also have to learn, but it's being very clear about who you are, what you feel, and, you know, not letting them kind of twist that around. So maybe just saying the same thing again and again. What I meant was this. What I meant was this. <laughs> um, and try not to be, um, get into an argument, I guess. It's like asserting yourself without uh, giving them more fuel. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. Yeah. Spiritual friends coming to these retreats. Yeah, and maybe in time there will be a chance to get more distance there. I hope so. Okay, in walking meditation, I sometimes notice that my legs seem to move on their own. For example, when standing, I think I might start to walk soon and my legs move before I have an actual determination to walk. What is an appropriate way to meet this situation? Thank you. <laughs> Curiosity and investigation, I think. Just uh, look at that and see what's going on. Um, apparently there have been some scientists researching like our um, will and they have actually shown that there's a, a gap between when the brain is triggered to kind of basically something happens in the brain that would trigger a movement and our time that we become aware of that intention there's a gap there so I think it could be true, actually, depends how deep you meditate. It might be true that they do start just before you actually know that you've willed them to start. Um, so it's really interesting. I find that really interesting. Use a lot of investigation and curiosity. Don't worry about it. Um, just keep observing. It's all good. <laughs> okay, anything from the floor? And people are literally on the floor here. You're so 
unfortunate here we've got a real relaxed group <laughs> yes yeah okay someone's asking what made me want to be a monk in other words a female monk uh, or a non bikini so um, i was motivated by suffering i have to say and a, and a a quest for meaning in my life so that quest for meaning came up urgently when I was about 15 um, to the extent that I couldn't actually make any worldly decisions about even finishing my GCSEs. I did but I kind of didn't work for the year before I took them so much to my mother's horror it wasn't straight A's uh, <laughs> but that was fine by me. I mean, it was just a kind of crisis really and some people put it down to sort of hormones in your teens but someone else recently said to me it's such a shame that these things are put down to that because sometimes that's a real genuine question about why we're here and what our life is for. So fortunately for me, I had um, a very good best friend who's still my best friend. Uh, and we had a similar feeling that we wanted to know what this is all about, like why we suffer, what's an appropriate response, what are we here for? And we decided to go to India together at 19. We'd already put our feet in the water by going to Israel for a few months. And uh, then we got more brave and we decided to go to Asia. And there I um, heard about meditation retreats and I just thought this sounds fascinating. I want to investigate my mind. I want to see like what's going on inside that causes suffering or causes happiness because to me it was quite clear that it didn't come from very much outside. Like there was nothing obviously bad in the outside world in my life, but it was a really deep sense of like, I can't go through this again and again. There's just no meaning to it. There must be a meaning to it. Um, so when I heard the Buddha talk about the Four Noble Truths, that the suffering and a meaning to the suffering, we can understand it and we can actually find a path out. I was just, that gave rise to such deep confidence in the path that I just, I decided to spend the rest of my life following that path. And it took 10 years to find an opportunity to ordain. But in that time I did like 60 retreats and served about the same number of retreats I just dedicated most of my life to it and finally found a place to ordain so for women unfortunately there's not a lot of op opportunity but I didn't see anything else I wanted to do in my life so when the opportunity came I just leapt <laughs> yeah yeah there's a bear coming to say hello to everyone I don't see if I'm showing you it properly or not but Okay, am I going to the chat again? During meditation, I felt like I managed to let go, but I'm not sure if I was falling asleep. I was sort of conscious of what were like dreams, but came back to the metaphrases. Does it sound like deep meditation, the right path, or falling asleep? <laughs> it sounds like uh, <laughs> a bit of everything. It's part of the path somehow into coming to more clarity so initially when we start to get peaceful we might fall into a kind of bit of a blur and that's usually because our minds aren't used to being so peaceful so our mindfulness is not strong enough to maintain awareness when we get calm um, so it's as though the calmness is stronger at this stage than the mindfulness and the lights of the mind just need to be turned up so I actually think it's quite good that you sort of drifted, but then came back naturally because one of the things people do is fight it and that's never helpful at all because then you're just kind of swinging from sloth and torpor into kind of restlessness and back in sloth and torpor. Your brain just needs to dull out for a bit. So it's okay. And then coming back to the metaphrases is great, isn't it? I mean, imagine if every time we slept, the first thought was the metaphrases. So that's really good. Obviously, it inclined your mind well going in and it came back going, coming out. So it's kind of a natural course that many, many people go through. So it's not deep meditation because after deep meditation, you, you know what you're aware of and you're also very, very vivid and bright. Um, but don't worry about it at all. It's not a problem. So, yeah, it's a sign that you're getting peaceful and the mindfulness will follow in due course. Uh, okay, someone's asking 
for more about boundaries. Can I say a little more on boundaries? Heartfelt thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I'm very good with boundaries. I'm getting much better. Um, but some of the Buddha's boundaries, ones that have been helpful for me, are coming from this book that I have in front of me because I thought maybe I'll read something from here, but it depends where we are in our questions. Um, one of them that I read recently in relation to someone who wanted contact with me again is that um, we shouldn't give feedback to people who are likely to respond with anger or with, um, what do you call it, when somebody uh, retaliates really. Um, you say something to them and then they say, oh yes, but you're like that and you did this and you did that. And the Buddha said, because it would be troublesome for us. So the Buddha's always concerned with reducing suffering for ourselves and for everyone else and protecting ourselves through loving kindness for ourselves. So he's not saying always walk into situations, you know, which might be harmful. In fact, he's saying if you know it's going to be harmful, don't. And I think too often most people go a little bit too far and they only realize afterwards that it was harmful. And so then they have to kind of retract their steps. Um, so of course it's very good to try and help others, but it's really important to know who you can help because we can't help everybody and somebody has to be amenable to our help and to our kindness. You know, it doesn't make sense to kind of, uh, you know, try to serve somebody or to point out the way to somebody if they really just don't want to know, or if they're using that as an opportunity to kind of, um, yeah, if they're just getting more and more upset. I mean, I think he says this not only for our sake, but for their sake as well, right? <laughs> because it's not really helpful for somebody if they uh, do respond with ill will. Maybe they're very sensitive and they can't deal with any criticism or advice. So that's one little bit about boundaries. Um, sometimes it's almost, yeah, sometimes when you're actually in a situation where somebody approaches you, in a negative way. The Buddha also says that, um, and this is right in front of me now, he says that people will address us with a speech that is either kind or filled with hate. They may address us with speech that's timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh. But when that happens, we should train ourselves. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no evil words. <laughs> We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. So here the Buddha's saying, you know, that that is also a way of having boundaries. We protect our minds because sometimes we can't avoid those things, right? We really can't control other people, but we can determine to remain loving and compassionate and peaceful. And sometimes that means, you know, walking away, right? First, we try to have that metta and then the compassion and then there is a sutta which says metta, then compassion, then we try with, um, I'm not sure if the next one is ignoring that person. The next one is equanimity. Ignoring means kind of walking away, right? The next one is equanimity. And the next one is understanding that everybody's uh, the heir to their own karma, right? So we try with the metta, we try with the compassion. But then sometimes it's just not possible and we have to take our space. Yeah, I hope that helps a little bit. I definitely recommend this book. It's really wonderful. It's about social and communal harmony. So there's a lot in here. It's by Bhikkhu Bodhi. And there's a lot in here about relationships. Cool. Social and communal harmony by Bhikkhu Bodhi. And it's straight from the suttas, but he's got a little introduction to each paragraph. So it's about things like patience under provocation, dealing with resentment, establishing equitable societies, proper speech, uh, wise friendship, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Anything else from here? Yeah. Um, can I just say about it? So, so I don't know, that sounds like a criticism when I say it, but it's a you know, a new training. I worked in mental health. It's uh -huh. a new to say narcissistic personality. You're right. Criticise people who are probably having their own struggles. And I just think yeah. if we can word it a bit more. Yeah, I agree. That yeah. Those people are just, we're jarring with them in yep. some way. 
and it's not quite working, but it's not, it, otherwise it feels like us and them, they're the baddies and we're Right, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. So someone's um, saying, and, and you're a psychologist, I believe, or, yeah? You're a psychologist? Sorry, no. just for the Zoom group. No, I'm an optician. Oh, okay. Okay, you work with mental health. So they're saying, can we find other um, ways of describing people with these behavior patterns of narcissism, which could be one way, behavior patterns, other than something like personality disorder? And I kind of, a I labeling, yeah. Labeling, yeah. Implying that person's a baddie. Right, right, right. Where the yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, they're with their own struggles. Right. Jarring against however we're doing. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Managing what, not managing the interaction. Hmm. Yeah. There's no fault to be had. Really? I'm not sure. Yeah. So this lady's saying there's no fault and it can create that sense of self and other or goody and baddie, yeah? And I hear that concern, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I mean, I've been in a relationship with someone who you could easily put loads of labels on. Mm. Honestly, you could look at the million things you can yeah. have. Yeah. Borderline has narcissism. Yeah, yeah. Narcissism. Yeah, yeah. But that's just because I'm trying to confirm my belief that they are, mm. they're the wrong one because I feel hurt or mm -hmm. sad because of the interaction. But actually, you know, when you talk later, when we're not in this relationship, you can see he he's just having those struggles. Yeah, too. yeah. It's when we're trying to relate to each other, we're reacting to each other. Mm -hmm. So rather than give the other, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. Absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise, it just makes us feel like we're yeah. Yeah, for me, I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So you're saying you're not comfortable with that, and and would you like me to give my um, response, or or you wanted to make more of a comment there? No, 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 no. I yeah. Just, just, um, okay. Yeah, I don't know what I want you to do with it. Yeah. Because <laughs> I know what we, it's ever so we can use those statements. Yeah, yeah. Because nobody used to say narcissism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, just to make a small comment, when I used that now, I was re relating to somebody who used that terminology in a question to me. And for me, it didn't so much describe a person as a kind of cluster of behaviors that I could relate to. And because I could relate to them and identify with them to an extent, I had a kind of broad outline of maybe some ways to respond. But I completely agree that the word personality disorder is really quite, almost quite cruel. Because obviously as Buddhists, we don't even believe in a personality or a fixed sense of self. And I, I do think it can kind of fix people and almost, you know, put them in a, a situation where we feel or they feel that there's no chance to grow <laughs> yeah and and like you say you know all of us can have traits in that way or another way but there are also things that i mean i do kind of trust in modern psychology that there are things that can be classified as you know more um uh dysfunctional than just person than just traits there are things that are more difficult to handle um and I'm not sure it only manifests in our own relationship with a person. I mean, if it does, then yes, but sometimes it might manifest with many people in many situations. And these kind of people, like, you know, some of the political leaders in the world, whether you say they've got this or that personality disorder, there really is an issue with the way they behave, you know, and it's something that if we can identify, there could hopefully be some treatment. But I, I really do agree that it's very, sensitive and subtle in terms of potentially causing more harm but i also think you know there are a lot of people who are struggling with in abusive situations and you know at that moment i think we need to focus more on their well-being at that moment than uh you know making allowances for people that can continue to harm us so i don't know i think if it's used in a way to identify a real problem and then actually remove ourselves from a harmful situation it can be good but then getting fixed on it I think I'll just it's yeah try not to use those terminologies yeah mm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you yes another question on something so following on a bit from Kristen as well, uh, when you said um, what much pain did you suffer? Yeah. And um, 
Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that, because that's not quite what I meant. So it gives me the chance to clarify. Um, so the lady was asking about um, when I wanted to ordain, I said that, you know, there was nothing particularly wrong in my life at that time. Um, and the suffering was something that came from within. Um, and she wants acknowledgement that the, there's a lot wrong in the world and there's a lot of suffering, people being cruel, not having loving kindness, etc, etc. So I think what I was talking about was more that um, I realised because I had quite a nice family, friends, good at school, that the basics, like compared to people, say, living in poverty or living in a war zone, I didn't have anything overtly uh, terrible to contend with compared to most people. And yet still, I realised I wasn't happy. And one of the reasons for that was actually understanding what was going on in the rest of the world. Because I remember when my parents used to watch the TV and all this news would come in every day about the wars in different places and about the greed and the politics. And I was really quite distressed by all that. And so what I felt in terms of the suffering was that it wasn't about my life personally related to many other people's, although there were difficulties there. Um, it was more a sense of the suffering around in the world. It was this overwhelming sense of like, suffering and despair that felt like more than my own load, if that makes sense. So that was really what motivated me and also realizing it couldn't be fixed just by making my own life comfortable and at ease. It was, there was a deeper problem there, which was quite right, the greed, the hatred, the delusion in the world. So I felt like when I'm not gonna be able to fix that, and I went through many ideas of different careers I could have, but I thought the only way to really fix it is to eradicate that in myself. So when I found the path of practice, I just felt like here I have a tool, you know, and here's something that could help the problems for others as well, you know, by, by really turning within. Because I think no matter how hard we try to change things outside, you know, and it's important to do that. But however hard we try, if we don't change ourselves or if other people don't change themselves from within, they're just going to re-arise. So for me, the more I kind of work on my own um, to undermine my own greed, hate and delusion, the more I have to give to others because it's those things that actually prevent me from, you know, being kind and serving. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Can I see if there are any more? Yes. Um, we just want to say deep gratitude to you for sharing what you've shared today. And I think it takes a lot of courage to share our kind of vulnerable stories and then yeah. really close to our heart. And I, I think, um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah. And you can just really feel your love and your authenticity oh. and your realness. Um, and I think it's a really very beautiful gift. Oh. And I, I go on lots of retreats and um, work. Um, yeah, I do. In, in kind of well-being and mental health and I think there's something really special when the teachers will kind of really open their own heart and share their own vulnerabilities and stories. <laughs> I think it really needs to be oh. Thank you for sharing your stories. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. That's really nice. And I'm glad if it helps others to feel, yeah, like they're not alone with those things. So yeah, thank you. The person was just expressing gratitude because they said that not all teachers would share and um, and that uh, being vulnerable and open is, uh, yeah, appreciated here. So, <laughs> good. Um, right, well, we are actually at quarter past four and we only have another half an hour. And I also see that there are a lot more questions in the box, at least one here. 
Um, <laughs> and okay, I will just go to one more because I think it's really important. It's the one right in front of me. So my teacher always said the one in front of you is the most important thing in the world. So it's not that other people's questions are not important, but this is the question that I'm seeing on the screen. So a last question and then we'll have a little break. So thanks for sharing your experience of vulnerability arising when on retreat. I lost my partner and brother last year and my experience of loss and grief has become a place of practice. A colleague who practices told me she didn't understand my grief as I knew they were both going to die and I was a Buddhist exclamation mark. Could you say something about this perception that as Buddhists we're not supposed to show emotions? P.S. I have a teddy bear too. <laughs> Yeah, lovely. And someone else also says they've been practicing with the grief of losing their partner last year. Yeah, I mean, to me, if someone says that to another person, it could be a sign that they're not comfortable with those emotions themselves. Um, obviously, putting a label on yourself as a Buddhist or wearing a robe doesn't suddenly eradicate certain emotions. And thank goodness for that because we are supposed to feel loss and grief. It's a natural part of human life. You know, it was one of the things that caused the Buddha to go forth, right? He saw the sick person, he saw the dead person, and he'd obviously suffered a lot, maybe not in, that he knew about in his life, but that struck, you know, very deeply with him and he realized there's so much suffering in the world. So, you know, without going through these things, we wouldn't really be able to have the opportunity to learn to relate to all emotions that are human and that everybody experiences with kindness and with wisdom. So it's part of human life and it's part of when you have learned to go through those things, it's part of what will make you able to hold that space for others and be compassionate and caring to them as well. And, you know, not deny anybody their emotions because, you know, basically whatever arises is a product of causes. You know, certain things happen. You've been very close to a person. You've been very much in love or, you know, you have a brother here. And obviously, if you lose somebody you love, you're going to experience some kind of loss and grief. But as a practitioner, let's say, as somebody practicing to come out of suffering, rather than putting that label on ourselves, um, we would just see where we're actually adding to the loss and the grief and rolling in the loss of the grief. There's two extremes, either we roll in it and we kind of amplify it and we don't know how to actually take a few steps back once in a while. Or on the other hand, we might try to suppress these things, you know, um, and push them away. And that is not wise at all. So the middle way is to learn to meet the suffering with kindness, with wisdom, with an open heart, and really give yourself the time to process these things. You know, they're going to change over time. You're not always going to feel the way you do right now. There's going to be different degrees of grief at different times in a single day, maybe in a single hour. Um, and that can be a great teacher, a teacher around impermanence and suffering and also the non-self nature of these things. You know, they don't belong to you, they belong to nature, right? Nobody can control when they arise and when they don't. So, you know, nobody can uh, tell us how we should or could feel because how you're feeling is exactly how you should be feeling right now. There's no other way that you could feel other than the way you do. So our job is just to learn to relate to these things with kindness. It's as if the grief that arises is the past karma, you know, it's arisen from a cause. But now when it's in your mind, how can you relate to that in a way that softens and heals, sometimes just allows it to be, you know. So just practice with these perceptions again, perceptions of kindness, of warmth, of welcoming, embracing, accepting, sometimes just letting be. So that's really our job. And yeah, maybe don't um, engage with other people too much if they don't understand you, because that's not very helpful. So yeah, that's probably more a reflection on their own relationship with grief. Okay, so I think that's probably the Q&A session for today. There's so many, huh? Okay, wow. Yeah, I don't know. I think... Do you think we should have one more? How do people feel? One more question? There's so many questions from here. Sorry? I'd rather meditate. You'd rather meditate. Um, 
Okay, any, who would rather an, one more question in this room? Okay, most would like to meditate. So I'm sorry for those who didn't get the questions in. Tomorrow, if you can keep your questions really concise as much as possible, and, um, uh, and if the question you put in today is still pertinent, then just pop it in again, okay? But you might find that tomorrow you have a different question anyway. So, and some questions we have to just answer them ourselves. So I hope that was at least in some ways helpful. And uh, yes, now we're going to have some closing meditation for the day. <laughs>